Good morning, good afternoon, greetings, greetings to all, wherever you are. Uh, I welcome you to our panel on artificial intelligence and the spread of hate speech and propaganda, challenges and possibilities in the use of AI and its legislative regulation. This is a, a long, exciting title on this extremely important subject. I would like you to invite viewers on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube to type your questions in the comment section throughout the panel discussion. I would like to thank, I would like to uh, start by thanking our partner, the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, MIX, for organizing this important and timely forum and for inviting the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes, GAMAC, to feature its community's expertise on artificial intelligence and human rights under a legislative perspective. I am very pleased to moderate this panel in my capacity of chair of GAMAC. Uh, GAMAC is a political state-led initiative composed of states and civil society organizations that engages and supports states everywhere to protect their populations from atrocity crime by seeking to address root causes within their societies and to promote prevention at the national level as an upstream and permanent endeavor. Rather than a mere reaction, indeed GAMAC promotes globally the establishment and strengthening of national permanent atrocity prevention architectures. Today's panel is supported by GAMAC and co-organized by our partners the Platform for Peace and Humanity, the Sentinel Project, and Parliamentarians for Global Action. In recent years, advances in artificial intelligence technology have sped up significantly, and artificial intelligence is rapidly taking on a central role in our day-to-day -day lives. While AI is making the world a smarter, faster place, it is also accompanied by emerging threats against human rights standards and other disruptive effects. AI enabled disinformation, the resulting spread of hate speech and propaganda, as well as key norm issues and missing policy remedies are some of the challenges associated with emerging technologies. Our distinguished panelists will provide expert discussion on the legal issues and initiatives that are needed to tackle AI-enabled disinformation and spread of hate speech. I want to extend a warm welcome to our panelists. Let me introduce them. We will start with Mr. Ratislav Sutek, Executive Director of the Platform for Peace and Humanity. While one of our newest partners, we are grateful of their key contributions to our community so far. Then we will hear from Ms. Rashi Saxena, Global Project Coordinator of the Sentinel Project, which is another valuable partner of GAMAC. And last but not least, we will have the honor to hear from Lord Clement Jones, Member of the Parliament of the United Kingdom. Lord Clement Jones joins us in his capacity as Member of Parliament and was introduced to us by one of our oldest partners, Parliamentarians for Global Action. Now, let's start our exciting discussion. We will start with uh, Ratislav Sutec. Now, Ratislav, your organization has been analyzing key challenges and opportunities related to the legal regulation of the prohibition of propaganda for war. Now, can you please elaborate briefly on the misuse by artificial intelligence in spreading propaganda and how AI can be used to target the specific online contents? And how can criminal enforcement of the prohibition of propaganda for war work by using artificial intelligence? These are indeed very timely questions. So thank you, Bratislav, for giving us your thoughts on these questions. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, the invitation to speak about 
uh, such an important topic indeed. Uh, when it comes to propaganda for war, um, I think in Central Europe uh, here we have seen some kind of a revival of the need to uh, deal with this harmful internet content, especially after the February Russian invasion in uh, Ukraine. Uh, certain uh, online comments of public figures approving or uh, justifying the invasion have uh, received attention and uh, criminal investigations have been opened into these expressions uh, and several uh, online portals promoting the Russian invasion uh, have been blocked uh, by the national regulating agencies. I, I think this was uh, a timely step, uh, but globally this is not uh, something extraordinary. Uh, Google is regularly uh, publishing its six uh, months data compilation of uh, requests made by the states to remove specific content from the search engine, uh, YouTube, uh, etc. And uh, for instance, national security ground uh, for content removal uh, closely related to the prohibition of propaganda for war um, has been invoked in the past six months by uh, many states, um, including the US, Russia, uh, Poland, Turkey, the United Kingdom, uh, etc. And this shows that uh, this harmful content is not only uh, relevant in terms of uh, scrutiny under the freedom of expression, but also states uh, see such content as problematic for uh, their national security. Um, of course, addressing and countering hate speech and propaganda for war um, is a multi-layered uh, endeavor. Uh, which includes tackling root causes and drivers, uh, preventing it uh, from translating into violence and illegal use of force, uh, and also includes dealing with wider consequences uh, for the society. Um, however, the difficulties of addressing and legislating about propaganda for war, but also hate speech, uh, begin first with the definition. Uh, and a delicate uh, balancing between the freedom of expression and any limitations uh, to that which are um, always uh, sensitive in Western societies. Uh, the prohibition of propaganda for war is primarily conceived of um, as a special obligation to take preventive measures to uh, enforce the right to life um, and also to give effect to the prohibition of uh, the threat or use of force uh, in international uh, relations. Um, the legal regulation is uh, very rare, indeed, uh, it's only Article 20 of the ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but we also see some references to the prohibition of propaganda for war in American uh, Convention, uh, especially in Article uh, 13, Paragraph uh, 5. Uh, the only difference between these, these provisions is that uh, the American Convention, based on um, um, based on the proposal of the American delegation, included the qualifier that uh, the lawless violence needs to uh, be reasonably expected um, as a result of uh, such a statement, which is not uh, explicitly included in uh, the ICCPR, which is um, just very briefly uh, prohibiting the artificial, uh, the propaganda for war. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, is also uh, silent on the prohibition for propaganda for war, but uh, we uh, can already uh, deduce uh, some um, analytical explanations from the vast case law on the freedom of expression that uh, such statements would not be acceptable in um, the Council of Europe uh, jurisdictions of the domestic states. Um, the present developments, on the, the other hand, the regulations that uh, we see uh, increasing all around the world uh, signal actually quite a radical uh, change, uh, especially in Europe, where many states have been vocal opponents of the prohibition of propaganda for war. Uh, when the uh, ICCPR has been adopted, uh, we, we know that from the drafting history, also from the reservations and declarations that um, have been submitted. Um, but we also see a revival in domestic jurisdictions and a desire to regulate big uh, tech companies. Um, while this is mainly done in the hate speech uh, area, um, I believe that uh, a lot of these good practices can be directly uh, translated to uh, the propaganda uh, for uh, war statements. 
So, for instance, in May 2016, the European Commission agreed with uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, and YouTube uh, on a code of conduct on uh, countering illegal hate speech online. Um, and there are regular reports from social media companies uh, which are published into monitoring um, rounds, uh, informing the public how uh, the flagged content, the, the harmful content, was actually dealt with. But the EU is also trying to step up the responsibility regime uh, with uh, the latest attempts uh, to minimize uh, harmful content with the new uh, Digital Services Act, also known as DSA. Uh, while the proposed act provides that the definition of illegal content uh, should be um, interpreted broadly, covering not only uh, hate speech, uh, it remains to be seen uh, whether any explicit action will uh, result regarding propaganda for war. Uh, when it comes to national legislation, we have also uh, seen uh, quite important improvements. Uh, for instance, uh, the German Network Enforcement Act, uh, which was presented in 2017, uh, requires uh, social media uh, platforms to implement a transparent procedure to moderate uh, illegal content, uh, including hate speech. Uh, again, there is no uh, explicit reference to propaganda for war. Uh, another obligation is to remove this content, uh, which has been identified as illegal within uh, 24 uh, hours and uh, regularly report to the domestic uh, regulatory authorities. Um, the law was heavily criticized as uh, pushing platforms into the role of uh, some kind of privatized uh, censorship agencies uh, for the decisions that they, they have to make. Um, and it was, uh, it was suggested that uh, courts are uh, better suitable as uh, as a forum where uh, such claims should be dealt. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there have been uh, claims that uh, such time limitations and fines would uh, lead uh, these online platforms to over removal of uh, the the content uh, when risking uh, high penalties. Uh, in 2020, the law was uh, partly revised uh, to require social media platforms to forward uh, the identified illegal content directly to the Federal Criminal Police Office. Um, and this is actually a good uh, sample how uh, artificial intelligence moderation uh, can directly cooperate with uh, the national uh, criminal agencies. Uh, when it comes to artificial uh, intelligence more specifically, we also see some efforts to uh, regulate the, the use of AI. But again, uh, these regulations are general and um, practical implications for human rights and uh, propaganda for war uh, remains to be seen. For instance, the Council of Europe is working on an international instrument uh, regulating the use of uh, AI, which would also uh, include uh, connection with, with freedom of uh, expression uh, and also the EU is preparing its uh, AI Act uh, which is using uh, the model uh, based on uh, the risk-based uh, approach to artificial intelligence. Um, it should be noted that uh, artificial intelligence is already used in content moderation on uh, social media platforms and uh, there is no suggestion indicating that future regulations would change that. Um, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, to name a few, uh, they are presently uh, using a combination of AI moderation um, based on uh, machine uh, detection and uh, human moderators are kept in the loop and it can be expected that uh, AI will eventually fully replace uh, human moderators. Uh, now, there are arguments against and uh, in favor of content moderation uh, generally apply to any harmful content, uh, be it hate speech, but also uh, propaganda for war. Um, some arguments against uh, AI content moderation uh, have long been discussed in terms of uh, evidence of international crimes. Um, this could result in AI content moderation uh, blocking evidence of the commission of uh, the crime of aggression preparation for that. Um, let's take an example of a leaked uh, footage um, of, of a meeting, governmental meeting, where politicians call for uh, military action. Uh, the other argument um, appearing is that 
<clears throat> artificial intelligence is uh, incapable of fully uh, understanding the contextual uh, background of uh, these statements. Uh, so, for instance, let's take the initially innocent letter Z um, before the Russian invasion uh, and after uh, the invasion. So this has been such an issue for uh, several brands all around the world. Uh, for instance, Samsung has stopped uh, using the letter Z in some uh, online advertisements of its uh, foldable phones in order to be uh, avoided uh, as being flagged as uh, harmful content. Um, on this occasion, it is also argued that uh, AI uh, cannot uh, fully understand coded language present in propaganda for war, um, including some uh, militaristic language. Um, however, a practical application of artificial intelligence uh, already uh, suggests the contrary. Um, the U.S. company called Primer uh, has developed uh, an artificial intelligence which has been uh, supplied lately to the Ukrainian military. Uh, the AI was able to provide surveillance of the Russian uh, military based on the intelligence that uh, AI uh, has obtained from the intercepted uh, Russian communication. Uh, another argument against uh, AI removing propaganda for war may arise that the AI is incapable of filtering uh, statements advocating for uh, illegal uh, use of force. Uh, but this is not an issue uh, inherently present in the technology, but rather uh, the lack of uh, clarity of, uh, of the legal norms involved in uh, the use of force and freedom of expression regulation. So this was some overview of challenges I see in uh, the AI content moderation of propaganda for war uh, on the internet. Uh, but I'm sure there's uh, plenty more to discuss uh, in the Q&A and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ratislav, for this very illuminated, illuminating uh, first overview of some of the challenges. Uh, I think this is extremely helpful, and indeed, we will come back so for sure to certain aspects in the Q&A uh, part. So now we go to our uh, second speaker, and um, uh, I would go now to, to, to Rashi from uh, the, um, the Sentinel project. The Sentinel project uh, in 2013, launched HateBase, which is the uh, HateBase, which is the world's largest structured repository of multilingual usage-based hate speech available in 98 languages across 178 countries. It is an attempt to create a repository of words and phrases that researchers can use to detect the early stages of genocide and remains in active development. So Rashi, can you elaborate further on the findings of the hate base uh, and reflecting on the need for human rights to be actively integrated into how online spaces are governed? Can you share good practices and lessons learned on this? Uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, the, the floor is yours, Rashi. Thanks, Sylvia. I just wanted to check, can you, all, can you all hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, great. So hi, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, so our um, our logic and reasoning behind uh, starting HateBase was that we wanted to get a, a greater understanding of how the online world influences the offline world. We don't necessarily have that understanding um, and also understand how online coordination activities kind of result in in a better understanding of the overall dynamics in, in this case, the high friction environments that we usually work in, given that we work on mass atrocity prevention. So a lot of the a lot of the environments that we do work in don't necessarily have reliable piece of information. So we we've or rather we come up with the definition of of hate base or rather hate speech online as any expression regardless of offensiveness that broadly categorizes a specific group of people uh, based on malignant, qualitative, and subjective attributes. Uh, and these attributes can pertain to um, religion, nationality, ethnicity, class, and disability, and sexuality. Um, so this is our definition. We don't, we don't necessarily consider hate speech as localized insults. Um, and our idea 
was to build uh, an active monitoring database, so online hate speech, which is global in scope, but it can also be regionally focused. Um, and we also, since we also have, we also work with communities directly uh, and specifically the ones that are in harm's way. Um, we also kind of look at a more crowdsourced vocabulary and offensiveness approach when it comes to <clears throat> monitoring uh, online. Um, and for us, um, this would be, we're looking at hate speech as an early warning indicator uh, in conjunction with other aspects that you find, which are normally used. For example, misinformation and hate speech is always used uh, interchangeably. Um, and also wanted to say that the reason um, hate speech and misinformation and a lot of these phenomena aren't necessarily new. Um, it's just that the coordination and, and the manifestation of these aspects are different when online. But for example, you look at the previous genocides, um, you look at Nazi Germany or the Armenian genocide, uh, we, the, the rate of dissemination had, had probably required a, a lot of infrastructures and stakeholders coming in together. People had to have more financial re resources, but now uh, the rate of dissemination online is much faster. Um, thanks to social media. And it's also very difficult to identify uh, the source of hate speech or misinformation. Um, and now we kind of, we're essentially more of a monitoring tool. We don't police speech, but we're kind of trying to understand what's really out there. So we're monitoring publicly available conversations. So you have Twitter, Facebook, and all the training data sets that we've received from different organizations that are working on hate speech. So we work with we work with academics, activists, individuals, linguists, um, organizations from across the world uh, who want to use our, our data set for their purposes of research. And we've also worked with a lot of universities in the past. Uh, so we we've also realized that there are a lot of challenges, technical challenges when it comes to or rather rather with with the usage of AI because we do we do incorporate an element of it in our uh, in our work. Uh, so one is that there's of course there's not a strong understanding of the relation between offline and the online world and one is that there's also strong linguistic coverage is a huge challenge because what there are there are different dialects uh, what what might seem offensive in one particular context might not be offensive in another context. Uh, so for example um, a, a terminology in the US, in English, is very different from a terminology that's used contextually in the UK. Um, I'm based out of India. We have different dialects of Hindi. Uh, so that's one aspect that that is a huge challenge when it comes to com when it comes to the training of AI, AI, AI data sets. And also, of course, uh, the, the sheer volume of data that is now available, given that we have a lot more people who've gone online because of the pandemic and so many other factors, is that AI seems to be a more, um, we would say, humane option to be able to monitor hate speech because human moderators and their capabilities might be limited because if you can imagine the mental health implications that a lot of human moderators have by looking at heinous content for 12, 15 hours a day. And we've also seen that human moderators aren't necessarily paid and compensated well. Uh, so in that aspect, in that aspect, there might be a more accuracy with um, when it comes to monitoring with AI, but we also have our side of human moderators who of course check everything, and we also we also we're also not looking at when when we when we look at understanding hate speech. We do believe that online communities have a right and legal responsibility to moderate user activity and to ensure you know fair treatment of users. But uh, we also think that ostracization of one there's there's also a blurred line because not. We, we don't have a universal definition of hate speech, um, online hate speech per se. So a lot of ostracization of unpopular speech in, in the developing world is seen as hate speech or labeled as hate speech. So many of them have been incredibly broad um, and they're also used domestically to, to suppress uh, opposition of speeches. Uh, we specifically look at it from 
a content and linguistic aspects aspect of it. So we don't have the ability to do that. And we also think that allowing discriminatory content to proliferate silences marginalized voices, which is a form of censorship. So what is the solution that we found when it comes to be able to allow allow or rather help us have a clinical understanding of hate speech. We introduced something called the Citizen Linguist Lab, which anyone can contribute to across, um, across the world. Um, and it's basically to have, a, to have a better social and cultural uh, understanding on the ground. Uh, the, the platform at the moment is uh, going open source. Uh, but earlier we, it, and of course it can be anyone from across the world is allowed to, is allowed to contribute to it effectively. Uh, and so you can be based in Latin America or, or South America or, or even in Asia. Uh, so you don't have to, you don't have to necessarily be a linguistic expert if you understand that particular language. And we're, of course, we're also looking at increasing uh, the number of languages that are already available uh, to be able to, you know, contribute and understand it. So we, of course, we, we categorize it differently uh, into our systems pertaining to gender, sexual orientation, disability, and class. And we also have something called an offensiveness score uh, so that even even the ones who don't necessarily want to input a terminology uh, can also rate the existing terms that are available. Currently, we have around 4,000 terms, um, uh, which are spread across 178 countries. Uh, we also have sightings, which is the frequency of these terms. So we have close to 950,000 different sightings. And the uh, and go back to the offensiveness score aspect. Um, this can or this is also for us to be able to understand uh, the social climate of the regions that we are dealing with because we've realized that hate speech is very contextual. It depends on the two people who are talking to each other. It can be between two different tribes um, or between a minority group and a majority group. So it's very, very contextual and specific. Um, and for the offensiveness score also helps us to understand that there are there's some terminology which was, accepted perhaps 40 years ago, which is now, which now seems uh, offensive. And our primary users and beneficiaries uh, are always people on the ground um, so that, you know, the average citizens can have more understanding and agency to be able to tackle these issues. Um, and of course, 90% of our use cases are free and we've now completely gone open source so that we can also understand from other people across the board on what we can do to be able to improve our systems um, and then we also look at the we also look at for us to be kind of looking back and the takeaways what we could say is that we are always on the side of um, education and counter messaging uh, rather than censorship because we've, we've realized that censorship might not be the most effective way and it can kind of reinforce the beliefs of a lot of people who are who are in in the field of propagating um, hateful content uh, and of course um, all of the things that we do uh, it's also very independent uh, it's done very independently and transparently because we understand that a lot of terms we do get are very sensitive in nature so a lot of the information is of course personally anonymized. And yeah, uh, perhaps that's about it. Uh, and I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashi, for these very uh, interesting uh, reflections on, 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 on this, uh, this important subject. I will now move to our next and uh, last uh, speaker for, for this round. And uh, before I, I, I turn to Lord Clement Jones, I would like to remind uh, participants to please send your questions via the chat feature. Mm -hmm. So uh, as soon as we end this first round, we can address these questions. So uh, Lord Clement Jones, as a member of the parliament, can you elaborate on the role of uh, members of parliaments in prevention? Uh, in particular, the role of member of parliaments in adopting human-centric artificial intelligence laws to prevent and address the repression of dissent and vulnerable individuals and groups. 
And uh, can you provide us also some examples of risk assessment and policy recommendations in this regard? Uh, Lord Clement Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Sylvia. Um, uh, I, I, I am going to concentrate um, today pretty closely on uh, social media uh, regulation and the issues that arise from hate speech uh, uh, on social media. Um, I've worked quite closely with the Council of Europe, uh, with the OECD, uh, on uh, AI regulation, the broader aspects of uh, making sure that AI is fit for purpose and uh, is risk-based and uh, uh, basically uh, uh, um, is our servant, not our master. Um, but the, the really important area at the moment, which I want to focus on, is, uh, if you like, the role of algorithms, AI, uh, in social media. And I think um, uh, all parliamentarians, regulators, need to... Uh, approach this in a fairly humble fashion uh, because, uh, you know, we've had some problems, I think, in catching up uh, with the technology um, over the years. I mean, uh, we need to remember that the last time uh, in the UK, and my um, what I'm going to say is mainly related to uh, what we're doing in the UK to combat things like hate speech and misinformation and disinformation. Um, but the last time we actually revised our criminal law um, in the area of uh, uh, hate communications um, was uh, when only 12.6% of our population had a computer. That was back in 1988. Um, and the internet was not even invented until 1992. Um, so the revision that we're undergoing at the moment is long overdue. Uh, and we need to remember that Facebook uh, came in uh, uh, only a year after our last Communications Act, which was 2003. So Facebook has been around uh, in some form or other since about 2004. Twitter followed in 2006. Um, so uh, uh, the regulators are struggling uh, to catch up, um, particularly uh, in the online area, um, I would say. And the real dilemma that they have is precisely um, uh, what we've heard identified by Erastis Lab, which is this uh, uh, problem um, about um, perhaps um, over-regulating uh, 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 or over uh, uh, compensating by social media platforms the dangers uh, to free speech. And I think we have to be very cognizant of this really important aspect that we need to uh, hold the ring between freedom of expression and making sure that hate speech, misinformation, uh, threats to democracy, if you like, are regulated as well. Um, uh, and in that whole area, I would also uh, include the right to anonymity as, as well. Um, and I think the, uh, uh, the fact that under the European Human Rights Convention, we have Article 10, um, is a really important uh, uh, aspect that we need to hold to and make sure that when we do legislate or regulate, uh, that we're making very sure uh, that we conform with that uh, uh, and make sure that freedom of expression is guaranteed, uh, despite our desire um, to make sure uh, that the uh, the worst forms of hate speech are uh, eliminated. And our Law Commission, which is a group of, uh, of senior uh, lawyers, including many judges, um, has been grappling with this whole issue of uh, uh, communications offences uh, and hate crime uh, for the last uh, three or four years. And now they've uh, uh, come up with uh, new uh, proposals and those are in parallel with proposals from our government, which have taken three or four years themselves to come up with um, in the online safety area. And so this is coming together. And this year is going to be a crucial one um, for UK uh, uh, regulation and legislation. And uh, uh, I think um, what has been really interesting is the growing realization that you cannot treat online very differently from offline for the purposes of liability. Um, and it's really important to make sure uh, that the social media platforms uh, do have and do own, uh, 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 take ownership 
of uh, 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 issues like hate speech and risk assessment um, for the uh, uh, the kind of communications that appear uh, on their own platforms. And I think that uh, understanding and that policy objective now um, to make offline uh, and online equivalent is a really uh, important aspect. So uh, uh, it was in that light that our Law Commission uh, uh, have now set out a new offence uh, that they want to see him uh, uh, brought in of knowing uh, of sending knowingly false uh, persistent or threatening communications which are likely to cause harm to a likely audience and the harm that they're talking about is psychological harm uh, it amounts to uh, uh, serious distress uh, there must be an intent to cause it uh, um, uh, but no proof of actual harm is needed so they've set out this really quite clear, um, offence that they want to see uh, in the communications area and then they've got another offence that they want to um, see broadened. We already had hate speech law uh, but they want to see that broadened into an offence of stirring up hatred on the basis of certain protected characteristics. Now there is some debate about whether misogyny should be included uh, in that uh, new offence but those two offences are going to be crucial uh, 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 if we're going to regulate our uh, online platforms uh, in the future. And uh, uh, I sat on a committee which uh, scrutinized uh, a draft online safety bill, which has now been introduced uh, into Parliament. And we said it was absolutely crucial um, that uh, these two new offences uh, should be brought in. Um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, that seems to be uh, the case because in order to satisfy uh, the requirements of Article 10 and freedom of expression, you really have to be uh, uh, saying you can't uh, 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 have criminal behavior uh, when you communicate. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're opening the door to government control of free speech uh, you're opening the door to uh, censorship, which uh, uh, Rashi uh, mentioned as being un, uh, highly undesirable, and I would entirely agree with that. Um, so that's, uh, I think, the background um, to where we are uh, in the UK. Um, and it's, uh, of course, online hate speech is uh, widely recognised as a societal um, problem. Uh, uh, we're in the process of trying to uh, make sure that we define it. Uh, in terms, as I say, uh, of likely harm to a likely audience uh, and you need intent and so on. Um, I think the area which is really difficult um, is the area of misinformation and disinformation, which has a societal impact. It's very straightforward to identify individual uh, impact or uh, the member of a likely audience and so on. What is really difficult is uh, to try and regulate where there's an impact on democracy. And, uh, you know, for instance, our Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament in the UK um, uh, uh, identified that there had been Russian uh, misinformation, disinformation by uh, bot uh, 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 accounts, inauthentic accounts, as they're called by the social media platforms, uh, during our general election and during our Brexit referendum. Now, we don't really know what the extent of that was. There were allegations, of course, um, during uh, the original uh, Trump election in the States uh, of the same kind of interference. And so uh, uh, that, I think, is the thorniest issue uh, that we have to deal with. And we haven't come yet with a solution except to say that uh, 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 if um, under our new legislation, uh, we have safety by design and we have risk assessment uh, as compulsory aspects of regulation uh, for, of the social media platforms, the very design of a platform should try and make sure that misinformation and disinformation is not amplified. Now, that's still fraught with problems because of the definitional um, issues. But at least if there's some systemic uh, uh, risk approach um, to design uh, by the platforms, then that whole area of amplification um, is uh, 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 something that we think will uh, uh, at least 
um, be uh, um, uh, moderated. Um, uh, I don't think we can say that it's going to be uh, eliminated, but at least we're going to moderate that. And um, uh, it, it, there are um, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, tools, if you like, which are really important. And, you know, identifying um, hateful content on social media uh, may be difficult, but uh, the platform certainly uh, uh, should have uh, the ability to do that. And uh, under our new piece of legislation, our online safety bill, uh, there is going to be compulsory risk assessment uh, in accordance with a risk profile drawn up by the regulator. Uh, there's going to be a safety by design duty. Uh, there's going to be uh, the ability of the regulator to audit the algorithms uh, which amplify and distribute content. Um, and there are going to be very strong transparency requirements. And uh, uh, that, I think, is one of the really important aspects uh, that we have to expect. So, you know, for instance, uh, we, we, it will be important that platforms say what are their safety by design features, uh, what are their terms and conditions, the proportion of users who are children, um, proportion of anonymous users, uh, proportion of content breaching terms and conditions which have been removed, and so on. So uh, there's going to be quite a long list of uh, transparency requirements that are required um, as part of the annual reports uh, drawn up um, by uh, uh, the platforms. And this is going to be, uh, I think, um, uh, a very important element of the uh, regulatory regime. And of course, you know, the growing reliance on algorithms uh, and algorithmic systems, um, uh, it, it, there, are, there are dangers in terms of personal data. We know the business model of the social media platforms relies on uh, 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 you know, people um, uh, uh, getting rather extreme content, and that is, you know, I'm not, I'm not really underplaying that um, because, uh, you know, having eyeballs, having clicks, um, is an essential part. Uh, of the social media uh, business uh, uh, model. Um, and we've got to make sure uh, that uh, uh, that is not uh, just something that perpetuates itself. And we do um, try and understand that. On the other hand, and we come to the freedom of expression point, it's really important um, that uh, we don't have a situation where genuine journalistic content, genuine content in the public interest uh, is uh, uh, not allowed on social media platforms. And if you like, they over uh, compensate uh, uh, for uh, the regulation that's imposed on them. And we were very keen um, to make sure that there was proper protection for journalistic content. That is uh, that appears in our draft legislation, in our in our legislation. Um, uh, uh, but I'm sorry to say that I don't think we've dealt with it in quite the proper way, because if you're a journalist, you're protected. But if, for instance, you're a blogger and you're blogging, you know, in the public interest, you might be whistleblowing or doing whatever. It is possible. It might be possible still for a social media platform to take down your content and for you not to have any redress. Um, in terms of the pluralism of uh, uh, and the diversity of media, uh, it's obviously extremely important that uh, uh, social media just doesn't simply dominate the news space. Uh, and so, of course, there is a role uh, for competition authorities alongside uh, uh, our regulation of the uh, uh, online space through our online safety bill. We also hope to see some new uh, uh, competition uh, uh, legislation with a new digital markets unit, which will have the job of making sure uh, that we do maintain uh, 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 if you like, com competition, pluralism uh, in the journalistic space. Now, um, I think one of the trickiest areas is the whole uh, area. Of sorry, thank you. Thank you very much, Lord uh, Clement Jones. I'm sorry for interrupting, but uh, your 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 time is up. But in addition to, to being up, you already have a question. Uh, so maybe I would like to ask this question for you, uh, since you are uh, now with the, with the, taking the floor. It's already a question about this online safety bill. Um, is there a concern that when we punish platforms for failing to moderate content, that we, we encourage them to be more or too liberal with their moderation? Um, yes, well, it depends what you mean by liberal. And there is a concern 
um, because uh, liberal in that context means too restrictive, actually, um, uh, i.e. Uh, moderate too much. Uh, and I agree. And this is really important. And this is why we criticized the previous version of the online safety bill. Uh, and we said that uh, to have legal but harmful uh, content, which was going to be regulated, created big problems because the Secretary of State, you know, the ministers, uh, would have the ability to say uh, what legal but harmful content was not allowed on social media platforms. Well, that's been removed now, and it's going to be specified in greater detail, and it's going to be subject to parliamentary oversight. So I'm very pleased, actually, um, that that has been changed, but it's still not quite good enough. We still think that the uh, uh, government, the Secretary of State, has too much power uh, over the decision about what kind of content uh, uh, is going to be allowed on social media. So that's why we stuck very, very closely to the illegal content, uh, including the new offences. And we weren't very keen on just having a sort of sweep up of legal but harmful, uh, which at the moment nobody quite knows uh, what the government have in mind. Um, so I absolutely agree with um, uh, 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 the questioner. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. And and you, like uh, the other um, speakers, have uh, uh, really also well emphasized the importance of freedom of expression, and uh, but also the need to uh, define further what we mean by harmful content. What is harmful and what is the limit uh, to becoming illegal or criminal? Now, uh, there is a, a question address also uh, for uh, Rashi uh, at this point from the speakers that I would like to ask to Rashi. Uh, Rashi, going back to the issue of maintaining the balance between timely tackling of online, this, of online the speech and freedom of speech, what role for artificial intelligence then? Uh, I don't know if you understand this question that comes from the speakers. Yes. Yeah. Artificial intelligence, perhaps, I mean, maybe looking at it from social media, a, a lot of uh, my, my fellow panelists also mentioned that artificial intelligence or some aspect of it is used by, by social media companies. And it's used perhaps at the first level, uh, because as I've mentioned earlier, there, we, we, we do need automation for the, for the, for the sheer volume of information that is out there. And there is different moderation techniques that are required for different platforms. For example, Twitter is a lot more open. You don't need, uh, you don't necessarily need an account to be able to view content, whereas Facebook is a lot more close. So those are the different challenges that are there, but an automation mm -hmm. element is necessary to be able to format um, and to be able to identify uh, the different lexicons that we have. So, yes, um, as as I as I said, we're looking at we're looking at it from a research element purposes. Uh, so we're essentially looking at at the frequency of the usage of these particular terms. Um, perhaps these are coordination activities that that are going to uh, result in a particular group picking up arms against a particular community or for us to be able to verify uh, an ongoing rumor in a particular community is true or false. And I, I hope I've answered your question, but I'm happy to. Thank you very much. And I see there is a question for Ratislav. Uh, from uh, Bratislav, building on your remarks, what would be good examples of effective enforcement of the prohibition of propaganda for war to prevent the outbreak of a conflict? Uh, um, thank you for the question. That, that's actually a tricky question because uh, in the broader context, we're really struggling with preventive mechanisms in international law. And uh, I think there is a place that is uh, often neglected and there's uh, where 
uh, the position of the propaganda uh, for war and um, the enforcement of the prohibition plays a major uh, role. Uh, there are no analytical data to really uh, support um, how effective is this uh, prohibition, if uh, at all it is um, applied in any way. Um, there's also only um, a handful of monographies, a handful of articles on, on the topic of uh, prohibition of propaganda for war, unlike uh, hate speech and misinformation. Uh, and in terms of uh, artificial intelligence implementation, uh, even less. Um, I was uh, going all over the internet to uh, find uh, how uh, tech companies have approached uh, sharing the, the letter Z uh, all over the internet. Uh, for instance, uh, a few Instagrammers have uh, have been spreading it in various content and promoting the letter Z, uh, and at the same time uh, promoting the, the invasion this way. And Instagram, uh, while it was flagged um, as uh, as an illegal content. Uh, has not removed it, uh, has not even considered it uh, as a harmful content. Um, so without uh, these data, we cannot really predict any uh, predict any uh, effective enforcement of this provision. This closely uh, relates to machine learning. If we want to design uh, design artificial intelligence capable of uh, tracking uh, propaganda for war over the internet. Uh, this requires uh, correctly labeled uh, samples to start getting good at prediction uh, and gradually progressing this task. And for that purpose, there should be a certain amount of uh, predefined content uh, flagged as propaganda uh, for war. Uh, if there are any uh, successful examples, we know them from the case law, which is also uh, very or extremely rare. Uh, the, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which is indicative that uh, this uh, prohibition of propaganda for war would not be uh, uh, supported under the freedom of expression, uh, gives us uh, only a handful of uh, indications in its case law. So uh, we have uh, examples from uh, the Turkish uh, cases of uh, Kurdish separatism uh, calling for um separatist claims from turkey uh poems online content which has been removed and uh european court of human rights uh, has correctly uh noted that uh such a content is not uh, not uh protected uh, by the freedom of expression this would be uh perhaps uh, one example how uh, turkey perhaps uh, correctly uh, approached uh, such an issue um, it was invoked under the, the National uh, Unity Clause, under the Prevention of Terrorism Act of Turkey. Uh, so this is, I think, uh, a good um, practice. I hope that answers uh, the question. Thank you very much. And I see there is also now a question for Lord Clement Jones. And... Um, uh, let me read the question for everybody. We have seen that members of parliament themselves are increasingly using discriminatory and violent language, especially during elections through online platforms to attack other peers and collectives who oppose their convictions. What can legislators do to ensure that as representatives of the citizens, they refrain from using such language and what mechanisms are there available to hold them accountable? Well, it's that's a really interesting question because the uh, 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 the, the GPA, uh, the PGA, is uh, has got a set of uh, standards which uh, they ask parliamentarians to sign up to. Um, I mean, and I think those standards are a very, very good template. I mean, you can argue whether. You can have a global standard given cultural differences. I mean, you know, the Australian Parliament, for instance, is uh, their language is a lot uh, 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 more brutal in some ways than the UK Parliament. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's still within the bounds of uh, polite or what one might regard as being uh, reasonable discourse. Perhaps polite is the wrong uh, wrong word. I don't think any discourse in our parliament is particularly, or the Australian parliament is, is particularly polite. Um, but I do think that that sets a very, very useful set of standards. Um, but it is, 
um, I think at the end of the day, a matter of law. And I don't think that um, you can uh, expect parliamentarians necessarily um, to uh, 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 hold, their, uh, hold themselves back um, uh, in circumstances where, you know, they're on a public platform and they uh, make a, a perfectly uh, a legal statement. Um, if they're inciting violence or hatred or uh, 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 discrimination or whatever it may be, um, then, of course, they will be caught and they should be prosecuted. Um, I think we should. So I think we should hold parliamentarians to a higher uh, uh, standard. But I don't necessarily think uh, that, uh, uh, you know, we should uh, regard it as a terrible thing if they if, if, as long as they uh, maintain legality. I think what we should expect the electorate to do is to judge them on their actions and their words. And so that if uh, a particular uh, 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 parliamentarians are uh, excessive in the way that they express themselves, then the electorate has to make up their own minds. But I'm I'm very conscious about the freedom of expression aspects. Um, uh, there are many aspects of the uh, uh, the PGA code which I think are great and actually relates back um, to the Turkey point that uh, was being made earlier. Um, uh, uh, you know, calling in aid. Uh, national security excuses, uh, I think, um, you know, sometimes can be uh, can be false and misleading. And uh, that is part of the PGA code. And I think it's a very, very good point, actually. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, reaching the end of this uh, really fantastic uh, panel on AI. And um, so we would have uh, some questions for all panelists. Um, this is a question to all panelists uh, that uh, comes from the audience. Uh, what is your intake uh, from Elon Musk's recent acquisition Twitter and his absolutist approach to free, to free speech? Apparently he said that free speech is that which matches the law. However, we all know that there are authoritarian countries where this may lead to the persecution of individuals and marginalized groups. So the floor is yours. Who wants to start? Shall I kick off? Um, yes. <laughs> Elon, Elon Musk is one of the most unpredictable people in the world. Um, so his opinions can turn on a sixpence. And now he runs Twitter and it's, uh, you know, it's got to make it, it, its way commercially as well. You know, he's paid $44 billion for it. Um, it's got to work. And, uh, it, 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 you know, I note that in the past uh, he's talked about being against the way that bots operate, um, which I think is very positive. But I think he's just got to uh, recognize that in many countries in the world and with the EU's um, uh, uh, DSA, with uh, uh, the UK's online safety bill, uh, Twitter will be regulated. And uh, I don't think um, uh, he's going to be able to shy away from that. So I hope that he's not a, really an absolutist. I think he may well change his mind. Um, but uh, if, if he isn't and uh, uh, he thinks that hate speech is, has a place on Twitter, uh, then he's going to find the regulators come after him with some very big fines. Thank you very much. Any other speakers want to to also address this issue? Um, I can second that and then follow up with a few comments. Um, so partially, I, I agree with the position on the differences uh, when it comes to matching um, how uh, free speech free speech will be regulated on Twitter and whether it matches uh, the law. Uh, we, we know for sure that uh, how freedom of expression is regulated in the U.S. and how it is protected uh, under the First Amendment is uh, completely uh, different from um, how European jurisdictions approach hate speech and um, hate speech and propaganda for war as well. Uh, propaganda for war uh, is mainly uh, regulated in criminal codes of uh, Eastern European states, uh, whereas in, in Western European states, many uh, of these countries have lodged uh, reservations to, to this provision. Um, so uh, Twitter and, and many other social media platforms, they uh, operate across multiple jurisdictions. 
uh, and based on this simple uh, simple division of how law operates in various uh, geographical regions, we uh, see that it's not simply uh, easy to uh, provide clear cut answers to how it should be uh, regulated. Uh, and as for uh, Twitter and its future, I uh, completely uh, agree that at the moment it's unpredictable. Uh, in Europe, a lot uh, is uh, counted on uh, the DSA. Uh, there are strong uh, fees uh, provided. Also, on the other hand, uh, it's a question how it will uh, financially impact uh, big uh, tech giants, uh, because this is the only uh, leeway how uh, the European Union presently uh, can, uh, can approach uh, big tech companies. Thank you very I, much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I don't know if, uh, Rashi, you want to uh, add a few words on this or any other matter. We are really getting into the end of our panel. Sure. Um, no, what, what I would say is that, um, as, as, as Ratislav also mentioned, that there are different jurisdictions where um, Twitter will be allowed to abide by the human rights um, and and privacy and security aspects of Twitter, so that's not going to go away. And we, I also don't think that we, no, we're not going to have no content moderation at all. Uh, it might be a platform that perhaps is more, I would say, politically neutral uh, compared to how Twitter was operating earlier. Uh, but I, I would say that if he really wants to fix Twitter, he should put the power in our hands so that the users can choose our own independent third party moderators to be able to filter our individual uh, Twitter experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we really, um, uh, oh, well, there is, uh, sorry, there is a, another question for Rashi, uh, but uh, very quickly because we really need to close now. And uh, this question says that given the way social media algorithms work by picking up and amplifying incendiary content, what can be said about the liability of social media platforms in situations such as Myanmar? I'm happy to answer that by email because I'm going to take a while to answer that, but I can do that if that's... Okay. Thank you. If you can answer this very difficult question very briefly, I would appreciate it. Um, no, I, you you would have to abide by the. I mean, this is a very complicated question, but there are. I mean, when, with the with the work that we've done in content moderation, you would need to internally downplay some aspects of it, and it would of course require a more, I would say, ver verification procedure, but. Yeah, social media companies would abide by their particular jurisdictions. Uh, unfortunately, that that is something uh, that they would in the situation with Myanmar. So yeah, it, it is a complicated terrain, and I'm 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 unsure if if they would be able to. Yeah, it it is when 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 the perpetrator is the currently currently elected government, it is a bit tricky. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is uh, this has been a, a great uh, a great conversation. I really uh, I really thank the speakers and the audience for for their questions. And uh, uh, it has it's been extremely useful. I I would like to to repeat some of the uh, of the uh, very good uh, formulations that you have made, including this important statement by Lord Clement Jones saying that well we need to think how we make a, 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 a artificial intelligence fit to purpose, mm, to be our server and not, and not a master. And that brings us back to what are we talking about when we talk about removal of content or harmful content. And indeed, clear definitions would also help uh, to, uh, 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 artificial intelligence and human moderation to, uh, to uh, help us to remove what is indeed harmful without affecting freedom of speech. Although we have also heard, and Rashi was very uh, emphatic on this, um, but I think all you all have shared this, that it is very difficult to define uh, something that is also very contextual and specific, and it would depend very much also what uh, is a specific uh, country or region 
uh, because the context indeed may influence what is acceptable or not in different societies. You have, but I think uh, you have all mentioned about the need of regulation. Again, you said we have to catch up with technology and technology, uh, although hate speech is not new, of course, we have seen this in the past, in past genocides, but uh, indeed new technologies and artificial intelligence bring new dimensions that were not contemplated in our existing regulations. And we see that there are regulation efforts uh, in many uh, regions of the world and in countries and uh, in many countries. So this is important, we are, although we are also recognizing uh, more broadly that uh, offline and online uh, hate speech and uh, harmful uh, dis uh, discourse needs to be treated equally. Um, we, you have not uh, developed this further. It could be said, it could be used, it maybe uh, could be the subject of the next uh, uh, panel on this and uh, next discussion is that we have talked a lot about regulations and sanctions, but maybe not enough about countermeasuring and education as probably a better remedy than simply looking at this from a, a criminal or a legal uh, 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 aspect. So, uh, but this will be for a next discussion. We really need to close now. I thank again our very distinguished uh, panelists and, our, uh, and uh, I also want to thank the audience and the organizers of this event. I thank you very much.